Hi. Um, right, the first thing I should say is, as I've pretty much told everybody I've spoken to today, I stepped off a plane at about 6 o'clock yesterday, so I don't really know where I am or what time it is. So uh, if I fall over, that's not part of the act, and I do need help, so just so you... Just so you know. So as um, my lovely introducer said, my name is John Ingold and I'm the creative director of Inkle, which is a company which kind of works with publishers. Well, I don't know quite how we ended up doing this, but this is what we do. We work with publishers to use game design ideas to make stuff. Not necessarily to make stuff better, maybe just to make different stuff, but to kind of make things. Um, and the kind of idea behind that is, it sort of stems from the whole, uh, the existence of tablets and mobile devices, these computer objects that we're now reading on and we're interacting with on a, on a daily basis. And a lot of what game design is about is about finding ways to make interacting with computers into a rewarding and meaningful experience. Now, that, that sounds very sort of highfalutin and, and kind of a bit weird, but I'm, I'm actually deadly serious about that. Um, when we interact with computers, we go into quite a strange headspace. I think anyone who's used Twitter knows that. You, you sort of lose sense of time. You, you want to keep clicking things. If you read on an iPad, you want to play with that page transition quite a lot, even more than actually reading the text of this book that you've bought. You want to watch that little curvy page animation. And there are reasons for that. And I think they're quite profound reasons to do with the way that people sort of interact with machines. But game designers have been facing this challenge for a long time. Um, you know, from the invention of Pong through Space Invaders through Pac-Man and Tetris and all of that, the job of a game designer has been to say, how do we deal with the way people interact with computers. How do we keep them on track? How do we make sure that they're doing the things we want them to do and having the experiences we want them to have? And I think that's something that publishing and digital publishing needs to be aware of and needs to be paying attention to, and so that's what we're doing with Inkle. Our sort of primary product, if, if we have one, is an interactive novel, which probably sounds like a terrible idea, but I, I don't think it is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later, I think. But um, you know, otherwise, we've been working with uh, interactivity on the iBooks platform. We've been looking at game design in the context of discovery websites or casual browsing through sort of assorted content. And it's all that question of how do you direct a player? How do you give them flow? And I think that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. Not a little bit about game design. A little bit less about gamification, but gamification really is about making games so long as we understand that games are not they're not about scores, they're not about treasures, they're not about fighting. Games are a very high level concept that means interacting with a system. That's what a game is. Um, so my headline point, I think, if, if you want to fall asleep for the rest of my presentation, or fall asleep before I do, um, if you're pressing buttons on a computer, you are playing a game regardless of whether you think you're playing a game or not. So game design is a way of thinking about it. It's not the only way of thinking about it, but it is a way of thinking about it. Uh, so. What's my background? Well, for the last four years, before founding Inkle, I was a lead designer at PlayStation. Um, and a lead designer is a, a job that's entirely about gamification. I'm, I wasn't the person who came up with the concept for the games that we made. I didn't say, hey, guys, let's you know, make a game about pirates. I think pirates are cool. That was my director and my studio director. They would come into the office, and they would say, we want to make a game about pirates. Pirates are cool. Uh, we want the players to have a sword. Uh, we like islands. And we don't want to get sued for copyright infringement by Disney. So that's your job. And then they'd go away. And with my team, we'd sit down and say, OK, uh, what does that mean? How do we gamify this concept that we've had dropped on us? How do we gamify this scenario? How do we turn it into something a player can interact with rather than just look at? Um, so yeah, so how do you get started on that? There was something that um, Liz Ross mentioned right at the beginning of today as well, which was about authenticity. She said that readers respond to authenticity. I think that's what she said. Um, and it's exactly that idea. You've got this scenario about pirates. You put pirates on the box. When people buy it, they want to feel like pirates. So how do you give them that? How do you not just give them a card game and they come out at the end of it going, well, it was quite a nice card game, but it didn't make me feel like a pirate? That's the question of gamification. How do you get that experience, that top-level experience, and actually embed it into the person who's experiencing your thing. And if that sounds familiar to the business of writing a book, well, it should. That's exactly the same problem. It's exactly the same challenge. How do you take your high-level goal and embed it into your reader, into the person who's paid money to see your thing? Uh, so the classic game design advice is this quote from Sid Meier, The Creation of Civilization, find the fun, um, which, you know, as a practical man, as a lead designer, this is no help at all because... <laughs> 
you can only do it once you've already done it. You can recognize it when you finish the game and somebody tells you that it's fun, but it's a little bit too late by then. So what we did instead was we kind of dialed it back a little bit from that. Uh, so in my time at Sony, I worked on a really very large range of games. I was quite lucky in a way that my studio was quite experimental, which is to say it didn't have that many successes. Um, and <laughs> which is sadly true. Um, we, we tried out quite a lot of things. So I've worked on games where you play uh, a fashion model, a chef, a politician, a cheating husband, an astronaut, a moody teenager. You know, and some of these projects worked out and some of them didn't. And um, the worst one actually was the politician. It was an eco game. The idea was to, to save the world and we had to can it because it turned out you couldn't win. Um, <laughs> which... Uh, you know, for an if, as an indie developer, I can get away with that stuff now. But if I work for PlayStation, I'm, I'm not really allowed to. So, um, so yeah. So where's the fun in being a politician trying to save the world? Where's the fun in being an astronaut? Where's the fun in being a chef? Um, so a better question is really not where's the fun, but how do we want the player to feel? The player sat down. They played this game for half an hour, an hour, two hours. How do we want them to be feeling? Can we answer that question? Um, and then if we can, what do we do? want the player to be doing that's going to make them feel that way. If the game is about the che if it's the cheating husband game, how do we want to make them feel? Do we want to make them feel cheeky, like some kind of 70s film? Do we want them to feel like Dudley Moore? Or do we want to make them feel guilty? Because that's completely different and lends itself to completely different gameplay scenarios. So you kind of say, well, imagine you open your eyes. You're in the middle of this game. You've been playing for an hour. You, the player, where are you? Are you clinging onto a drain pipe? Are you hiding in a wardrobe? You know, these are the kind of questions that we actually have to tackle as game designers, don't worry, I will bring this back to you guys and gamification in, in a moment. Um, so, in short, the problem with all of the examples that I've given is they're all hard work. Being a cheating husband is probably hard work. Um, <laughs> being a chef is definitely hard work. So how do you make the player feel like what they're doing isn't just hard work? How do you make it feel like you haven't just locked a load of content that they've paid for and you're not going to give it to them until they've done a job? And that's why games are relevant to gamification because when we gamify things that's exactly what we're doing we're locking a whole bunch of content and we're saying we're not going to give it to you until you've done something that's how gamify systems work um, to pick an example at random your, the loyalty card you use at a supermarket which isn't a very good piece of gamification but it is gamification there's a score you earn rewards as you do things and at the end if you're lucky they give you some money off which they could have just done in the first place and we know that but we still engage with it and we still go, oh, I'll buy more bananas because there's more points there. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, but we engage with it because actually we're kind of, well, there, there's something profound going on, I think, with rule systems, but I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so, yeah, so how do we want people to feel? What do we, what, what do we want them to, um, to get out of it? Another good example, actually, I think, is Foursquare. I just wanted to mention that briefly as an example of gamification that's done really well. So you know the app where you go to places and you check in and... If you check in enough times, you become the mayor of that place. That's a good one to start thinking about gamification and the question of how do you want your player to feel. What's Foursquare designed to make you feel? It's designed to make you feel like you're someone who goes out a lot, that you're a man about town, that you know the best spots, that you own them. That's what it's designed, and that's why it works. A lot of people look at Foursquare and go, well, I have no idea why anyone would do this, but people do, so there must be a reason. Okay. Unfortunately, we know that games are everywhere. We know that they're powerful. We know that they have an uncanny ability to make people keep turning up and doing a repetitive action, even though they don't have a reward from it. We've all seen that. Um, if you have teenage children, you've definitely seen it. If you've been a teenage child recently, then, then you will know it yourself. Um, but there is a problem, and it's a huge one, which is uh, game making is not a reliable process. Um, from my time in the industry, uh, it's up there, basically, um, I'd estimate that one in seven prototypes reaches production. We always make prototypes before we make a game because the budgets are so colossal. You, you don't just set off and spend 64 million pounds or whatever. You make a cheap little nasty prototype. Um, and most prototypes spend about a year in development. You know, you might have four people, five people working on it, sometimes larger. And then they're well formed enough. They've been built well enough. They've got enough content that people can cancel them because they didn't know before. Um, I worked in uh, the Cambridge studio in the UK. I suspect it was not a very large studio. It was about sort of 100 people. I suspect in larger studios, that kind of figure would be significantly worse. So I think the problem stems from the fact that game development is quite hard to... It's hard to be clairvoyant about what your game design is going to do. Um, it can be difficult to see in advance whether a particular game idea is going to play well 
without actually making the damn thing, and obviously that's very expensive. Um, this is very different from novels, I think, uh, or films, theatre. Elevator pitches for novels can be very accurate. You may say, you know, there's this boy, he's a wizard, things go wrong, he saves the day. That pretty well communicates that novel. Now it's just a question of whether you can write it well or not. But if the concept is sound, if you think you can sell the boy wizard, then you've got a product. Um, for games, the elevator pitch is almost always significantly more impressive than the actual product that's delivered. We say, in this game, you're going to save or destroy the ecosystem of the planet. Um, but what you actually get is a spreadsheet, and you click some icons. And, and that's, that's, it's all the wrong way up. Um, so the key skill in developing games, well, in developing good games, but also developing games efficiently, which is slightly different, and the key skill in good gamification is to be able to sense early on what is it about this game that's going to hold people's interest? And that's the key question if you're looking to do any kind of gamification. That's your core question. I want to hold people's interest. How am I going to do that? Because if I can hold their interest, I can make them do whatever it is that I've tasked them to do. Um, so gamification, right? It's quite interesting. If we stop talking about games just for a moment, I think I'll come back to them. And I was thinking on the plane over here, um, I was trying to think about that's a lie because I wrote this presentation last week. But um, I was thinking when I wrote this presentation last week what you guys might want to gamify and sort of came up with a list. But actually, Evan um, uh, from Bloomtree gave me a, a great example just this morning when he was talking about bookshops and the merchandising in bookshops. And he said that there was a problem that 2D screens are always worse than the 3D world for seeing things. And but yeah, that's absolutely definitely a problem. And it's an interesting problem in terms of game design because that's what game designers have been doing ever since the invention of 3D engines. Uh, I worked on a couple of 3D games and we spent inordinate amounts of time building these beautiful intricate landscapes, jungles, temples, space stations, whatever, and then stripping them down to make sure the player doesn't get lost or can't see the which way to go or get turned around. And then we light the doors so you can see which way is forward. And then we rig the camera so it doesn't get stuck. And then we have to make everything you're supposed to interact with yellow, because otherwise you just can't find it. And even then, people don't see it. And that problem of a 2D screen, even trying to replicate a 3D world, fails to replicate a 3D world, because the 3D world is incredibly visually rich and complicated, and we're really good at interpreting it. And we're not good at interpreting screens. And there's a massively limited amount of information on a screen. But game design has solved that problem. Game designers have solved that problem. Games contain 3D worlds. and Okay, 50% of the population still just run into walls the whole time, but the other 50% <laughs> do get quite a lot out of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so navigating a complex environment on a computer is exactly the sort of problem that game designers have been tackling for a long time, and that perhaps publishers and sort of those in the publishing industries are needing to start to tackle now. Um, my favorite example of that is Amazon's homepage. I mean, obviously, Amazon are a massively important player, they're incredibly powerful. But their homepage is terrible. It's designed using web standards from 1995. It's confusing. It's messy. It's very difficult to keep track of. I can never find what I want, and I'm computer literate. And I've been using it since 1995, and it hasn't really changed. No game would be allowed to have that flow. A, a sort of parallel game is Sid Meier's Civilization, which has huge numbers of options and very carefully structures it and very carefully introduces features and makes sure that you don't get lost. Because the game design is about coping with the complexity that arises from interactivity. Anyway, so what might you guys want to be doing apart from making 3D bookshops on 2D screens? Uh, you know, you might want to be trying to sell more ebooks. So perhaps you think that a game where people score points by reading ebooks or by buying ebooks lets them become the don of crime fiction or the king of fantasy fiction or something. Maybe you want to gamify that. Four square for books. I've heard that phrase several times. Uh, maybe you're looking to make a review and a recommendation website, um, something like Goodreads, but using a kind of crowdsourcing model. Uh, and you want people to become ace reviewers, and you want them to do that by writing reviews that everybody likes and rates, and maybe you could reward them with early access to material that then they can write about, and that gives you a game loop. So then you can produce quality reviews without hiring any reviewers. Maybe that's what you want to do. Maybe you're trying to crowdsource your slush pile. I don't even know if publishers have slush piles anymore. I think maybe they just commission everything. But um, you could get people on the internet to read your... Do you? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm probably in one of them from many years ago. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to deal with it, you could get people on the internet to read your submissions and rate them. You could say they earn status if they champion a winning manuscript all the way to completion. Maybe they get a cut of the royalty when it finally comes out. Uh, or maybe not. Um, <laughs> 
these are all great opportunities for gamification. The reason they're all great opportunities for gamification is because they're time-consuming, repetitive, basically quite dull tasks with a glimmer of reward at the end of them. Um, but that is exactly why they're good to gamify, and it's exactly why they're bad to gamify, because what you're trying to do is you're not trying to make people feel like a pirate, you're trying to make them feel like they've got a reasonably dull office job. So no, no offense intended, I'm sure you'll... Yeah, I'll, I'll move on. Um, <laughs> So how do you turn it into a game that feels like it's worth playing? Well, um, I don't think we need to be making games, as I've said now, I think four times, uh, to be able to learn lessons from game design. So the question really is, what's, what's the bones of the thing? I've got this, this chap who's been on my presentations for a while now. I don't know what he is, but I quite like him. Um, he's the bones of game design. So what are the bones of game design? Essentially, how can you tell in advance before you've made something, whether or not it's going to give you a good game experience. Because that's gold dust, right? If you can get that right, you're sorted. Well, I don't know, but this is what I came up with. This is what we used in my studio that cancelled most of my projects. Um, mostly, uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, that's just the, cult, the climate, I think. Um, so what do games need to be compelling and not cumbersome? What do they need to hook people and keep them hooked? Um, and that's my list. Games fundamentally have rules, they have progression, and they have unpredictability. So, firstly, rules. Uh, that might sound obvious, but it's incredibly profound. Games are defined by their rules. Their rules are what make them. The rules tell your players how they're going to operate within your game. They create the virtual space of the game into which your players enter. They delimit every action your players can take. They basically delimit how your players will be able to think once they're in the game, because that's what you do in games. You learn the rules and you think with the rules. Um, they do more than that, though. The rules are generally the first thing that you tell the player about your game up front. So they're also your elevator pitch. Your rules have got to be clear. They've got to be intriguing. They've got to sound like the thing you're trying to represent. Um, you know, a, a, an example of I've used for a while. If you say, in this game, you collect things to unlock things, and then the things you unlock let you collect more things, that's a much better description of a game than if you say, oh, and the, the things are conflict diamonds, and you're stealing them from corrupt dictators. That bit's irrelevant. If you tell people all of that, they'll forget that part. They'll remember that they're collecting things to unlock things, because it's the thing that they're doing. It's the thing that they're interacting and working with. So it's the thing they remember, because it's all they need to remember. Uh, a game... To go artistic for a moment, a game is a theatrical stage onto which your player stumbles uncertain and nervous, a bit like me up here. Their rules are their only script and the only guide they have to suggest what it is they're supposed to be doing and what will make them feel better about the dangerous and uncomfortable position they've put themselves into by starting to play your game. They are the set dressing. They are the code of conduct. And when you, the player puts your game away, the rules are the thing that's going to stay in their mind. So if you want them to come back, those rules have got to be compelling. Your rules have got to be fair and understandable and easy to remember. If you're making a game about knights, it's okay to have a rule that says you can't use a sword and a bow at the same time. If you're making a game about pirates, that's not acceptable. You can certainly have a, pi a pistol and a cutlass at the same time. It doesn't matter which rule makes for the better game. Players will object if it doesn't suit the thing that they're trying to imagine because they won't be able to remember it. So your rules have got to make sense. They've got to be acceptable. They've got to be a fair contract. They've also got to look like they're worth learning. That's part of the same thing. Thousands of men in the world will gladly learn the rules of cricket. I never did myself. But they won't learn the rules of multiplying fractions. And that's not because the rules of fractions are more complicated than the rules of cricket. So there must be something else. Uh, rules, if you're gamifying something quite abstract, like a slush pile or a a review site, then rules are really important because you can't even sell your game on the experience. If I'm making a game about an astronaut, I can at least maybe hook you with the idea that you get to pretend to be an astronaut. If you're being an editorial slush pile reader, then I probably have to make my rules gripping. Um, I have to give you something appealing. I have to say, I'm going to offer you reputation, status in a community, maybe a tangible reward. Um, maybe, though, actually I can give you something else. Maybe I can say, show you a way or give you a glimpse that if you have skill and insight within my game, you'll be able to do better than the competition. Maybe that's my hook. I set the rules up so that if you're the person who can spot the great manuscript in this pile of dross manuscripts before anybody else, that's a premium to you. And that's attractive because that's a way of 
just feeling slightly better than everyone else. And that's just a rule. It's just the way you set up the rules. But it has a huge effect on the way that the players and the people using whatever system it is you've set up will interact with that thing that you've set up. Um, I wanted to say one more thing about rules uh, after the talk that the Goodreads chap did about his algorithm, about his recommendation algorithm, which is obviously insanely clever and works very, very well. Rules are kind of games, or rather games, I, I think I mean games, are, are kind of the other end of the spectrum. For solving any complex problem, you basically always have two methods. You've got the centralized method and you've got the delocalized method, right? If you're solving the problem of how do you distribute goods, you've got communism, which says the government works it out you put up with the government, what the government says, and you've got the American model, the capitalist model, the Canadian model, that says um, you just give it to people and they'll sort it out amongst themselves. And the Goodreads algorithm is a centralized server that does the working out. It takes the information, it chunks it, and it tells you what it thinks is right. That's the communist model. There's nothing wrong with it as long as your algorithm is really good. But it's got to be really good, and you're in an arms race the whole time to make that algorithm better than everybody else's and to keep doing that. The alternative is the crowdsourcing approach, which is what market economics does, and it's what game rules do if you involve lots of players. So, um, say you want to make a recommendation site. Well, okay, people score points if they recommend books to other people, and those people like them. So if I recommend a book to you, and you like it, I score one point. If you don't like it, you wipe all of my points. If you, don't, if you like it, and you didn't already have it on your shelf, to read, I get two. If you did have it on your shelf to read, I only get one. So I could, I'm not sure about that, but I was thinking maybe I could go, like, I can go and research you if I want to, and then I can maybe score more points by finding those obscure books. Because remember we said uh, that Goodreads algorithm makes sure it, it finds non-obvious choices. So let's bump a premium on that. If we can find a book that you don't know about and you've never heard about, or that isn't in your extended network, then you get more points. And that solves the same problem, but it uses people to solve the same problem. And then you have a reward loop. So those are rules. And essentially, that's it. That's game design. That's gamifying. You sit down, you come up with some rules. If they're no good, you throw them away. You come up with some more rules. You keep doing that. Once you've got your rules, then you need to worry about sort of how you sell the rules and how you package them. But there are a couple of other things we should be looking for. And the second one is progression. All games have got to have progression. Um, once your player has agreed to play your game, you've got their attention for about a couple of minutes and not much more. So it's a bit like when you're starting to read a book. People, if they pick it up and they get past the, the first paragraph, they'll probably read the first three or four pages, but then the phone rings, they put it down, they never come back to it. Unless you give them a sense that there is a progression, that, that in the game, as with in a story, the experience is going somewhere, that in 100 pages' time, they're not going to be reading the same book they were reading just now. Um, all good stories have an arc. So does all good games. Uh, so does Pac-Man, so does Tetris, so, that, so does Space Invaders. Pac-Man is a great example, because it doesn't look like it has an arc, but if you think about it, Pac-Man starts with you running away from ghosts, just running away, and then towards the end of the level, you're actually trying to get to places, because there's the little dots you've left behind on the intersections, which you then have to get to. So suddenly you're playing a different game. You're playing a much harder game within the space of that one level. I don't think they thought of that. I think it's just luck, but that's why it works. So that when you finish, you've actually finished a harder problem than the one you were doing at the start, and there's progression. And then the next level is faster, and it eats your money. Um, if you talk to people after they've played a game, they don't talk about rules. They, say, they talk about narratives. They talk about a personal narrative. They say, well, this happened, and then this happened, which meant that happened, and then this happened, but then luckily this happened. Um, so one could say that games are systems for constructing narratives. I don't really like that. I prefer games as systems for, so for mediating social interaction only modern computer games, the person you're having interaction with is a computer. Um, but I think both are true. Games have got to have two players, whether the other player is a computer or another person, doesn't matter. You've got to be talking to something, but you've also got to be going somewhere. Progression is not about having a score. You can't just whack a score on something and expect people to care. Progression's got to be about meaningful change. It's got to be about objectives. Players are desperate to know what their objective is at every millisecond of a game. Um, perhaps that's similar to protagonists in stories. I, I know story theory says that um, you have to, this thing the protagonist wants, and they want it above all things, and they will do anything for it. Um, I, I think that's probably too simplistic, but in games it kind of isn't. People really want to know, why are they doing this thing? What are they doing? How close are they to their goal? Are they a little bit closer than they were before? Um, it's no coincidence that on a Kindle, the only bit of UI that shows up when you're reading is that little bar at the bottom that tells you how far you are through the book in a percentage term. It doesn't say anything else. It just says that, because that's the one thing that if you didn't have it, you'd be pressing the button 
and you'd start to worry that maybe the Kindle was just writing each page as you press the button. <laughs> and you genuinely would worry that. And if anyone can invent the program that does that and call it George R.R. R. Martin, then you're sorted. Um, why have I written that? I took a note earlier today. This is, sorry, a bit of a tangent. Um, another thing that Liz uh, Ross mentioned was the book crossing site where you send books off into the world and you track them, which I haven't heard of before, but is really cool. Uh, it's not a game, I think, but it does kind of have an avatar, which is the book that you send off out into the world that you then pay attention to. Um, and it does kind of have progression as well. I, I mean, I'm guessing when somebody checks that book in and says where it is, it emails you and says, look where your book's ended up now. So you get to see this journey this book has made. And you're not doing anything, so it's not really a game. But there's that sense of an arc being played out in the world. We used to have a game when I was a university student um, called the Traffic Cone Game, which was very similar. And basically what it meant was there would be a traffic cone somewhere in the, in, the, in the college. And as you walked past it, you picked it up and carried it a few steps towards one of the gates. And then you left it. And no one knew which gate it came in and out of, but eventually the traffic cone would walk all the way through college. But sometimes it would go backwards and forwards. At least I think that was a game. I did it. I know a few other people did it. I honestly don't know, because no one ever talked about it. But this traffic cone had its little journey across the quad, and there was a sense of progression. So we felt kind of affectionate towards this traffic cone. <laughs> people are silly, but people are also your market. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the point of progression is people need to be able to look back over the game that they played and think, wow, everything changed so much, and it changed because of me. And new players at the start of the game need to have a hint that that's going to happen. They need to have a sense that something is going to change. So most games, they'll give you a big menu of things that you can do, and then they'll gray them out. So at the start of the game, you look at it and go, oh, there's a thing there. I can't do it yet, but I will be able to do it later. That suggests a coming complexity. Very few games hide their light under a bushel in that kind of respect. They do a little bit so as not to overwhelm you, but they like to tease it, just as you tease things in books, just as you tease things in films. Um, game stories are usually hero journeys um, because there's one player on their own and uh, predominantly because of the market or the expected market of kind of male fantasists. Um, and generally, game stories are about people with stuff happening to them that makes their lives difficult, which is usually being shot at, but I think we can do better. Um, but it can be quite interesting if you're gamifying something abstract to think about it just briefly, at least in terms of the hero's journey. Like, if you're trying to gamify the recommendation of ebooks, what's your protagonist's obstacle? What are they overcoming? How, what's their goal? Are they, if they want to become the don of crime books, what are the things standing in their way? Are they risking anything? Do they extend their reach and power as the game progresses? You start to have these thoughts, and you start to think, well, maybe if I want to be the don of crime ebooks, I need to be able to take out other players or steal their ebooks off them. Maybe that would be appropriate. And that's quite an interesting legal area. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of segues me onto the third thing, which is unpredictability. And this is the one that gets overlooked all the time by professional game designers. I've overlooked it myself. It's very easy to forget about it because you're worrying about your rules the whole time and do your rules make sense and can people cheat and will people understand them? And you forget to remember that games have got to have an inherent unpredictability built into them. Game rules have got to make games exciting and intricate. That's got to arise from games in a natural way. People think of uh, games as sets of rules, yeah? and rules, are, are, they just work, and they're fair, and they're decent, and they're orderly. But um, we're not making totalitarian regimes. We're making something that is essentially meant to be fun, and fun generally rises from the unexpected. That's where we find it. So your rule set has got to encourage unpredictable events but then it's also got to deal with everything that will come out of those unpredictable events. So a great visual metaphor for that is the game of pool. Um, maybe that has a different name in America. Maybe it's called eight ball or something. I don't know. But anyway, you start off with a very organized set of balls. You wallop them. They go everywhere. They fly all over the place. But there are these cushions that keep them in play. That just If they go too far, they knock them back into play. And those cushions are the rules of the game that are just making sure that everything stays on track and doesn't get out of hand. So there's an interesting balance between the inherent unpredictability of the balls on the table and the regime of the shape of the pool table. And when the ball hops over the edge, everyone goes, oh my God, <laughs> oh dear, quick, get it on before someone sees. You know, it's, it's, an uncomfortable, it's an uncomfortable thing. Unpredictability is what turns puzzles into games. It turns your Sudoku into chess. It brings things to life. It animates them. Um, when you're gamifying, it's really important. Unpredictability is really important because it is the reward 
loyalty card schemes, one of the reasons that they fail, I think, to engage people is the reward is money, but you're in a shop, you're spending money anyway. Unpredictability is a much better reward. If you were collecting your nectar points, they are in Britain, I don't know what they would be here. Maybe they were Walmart points, um, Walgreens points, I don't know. Uh, you know, if you had a sense that there was something coming, but you don't know what it is, and then you get to, you get to the till, and they say, well, this is, this is what you've got for your points, and you go, oh, my God, I've got one of them. Uh, maybe that would be interesting. There was, um, I reminded of a game I played at, uh, I think it was a Christmas party or a New Year's party. It was called the Viking game, and I don't know why. And it started with a set of small objects wrapped in wrapping paper, and everyone got one, and then you rolled a dice, and there was a rule about how if you got a certain score, you could steal one of these objects or someone else. And people would steal these objects and kind of go, oh, I want that one, or I don't want that one. But they were all wrapped, so no one could know, tell what they were. But they kind of accrued value because people wanted the long, wibbly one or the, the flat one. And would start to really chase this little square one around the room. And then there's a stage in the game where you unwrap everything, and then you play a bit longer. And suddenly you look at the crap you've accumulated, and you're desperately trying to get rid of it. <laughs> and that's all about unpredictability. It's fun and it's engaging because of the unpredictability of that. It mixes everything up. We can apply those ideas to gamifying systems, so long as you've got a system in the first place. That inherent idea that if you can embed unpredictability in what you're doing, you will have a better thing. And I think that mirrors the point that, um, that Goodreads were making, that the unpredictability in a recommendation system is absolutely vital. If you haven't got it, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Uh, yeah, so you're basically just, it's not a big deal. You're giving your players a sense that there's something different around the corner because they're playing a game. And the thing about games is you do the same thing over and over again, so you need to give them the sense that that's not what's happening, because otherwise they'll get bored, which is fair enough. Uh, the final example of that that I wanted to mention was Twitter. Um, is Twitter a game? I like to think that it is. It has a score, which isn't important, but it does have one, which is your number of followers. Um, you keep coming back to it. Why do you keep coming back to Twitter? Is it because you think it's going to get you a better job, or it's going to make you contacts, or is it just because something might be happening, something unpredictable might be happening? Have you ever found yourself retweeting an article that you haven't read? <laughs> Have you ever found yourself retweeting an article that you haven't read and writing next to it, great article? <laughs> Why would you do that if it weren't to gain advantage in a game? Um, you know, even though behind the article, it's usually a picture of a cat. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, I took a very long note here in my handwriting, but I can't read it. Um, so, there's a, really good, there's a really good point here, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. So, uh, if you'd like to find out, you'll have to read my blog and follow me on Twitter. Um, so, what about books? What about stories? I want to talk about stories. Um, we talked a little bit about sort of gamifying writing and slash bars and gamifying discovery and and making sort of reading important and making competitivity out of reading and discovery and reviewing and all those sort of ideas. And, but I, I want to talk about stories because I'm interested in stories. My background is in video games, my background is in writing, my background is in interactive fiction. And at Inkle, what we're trying to do is take game design ideas and apply them into stories, in particular into books. Um, so we need rules, we need progression, we need unpredictability. Progression is easy, books are awesome at progression. They have a little score, it's called a bookmark. They, they go somewhere. If they don't, people don't publish them. That's well done, guys. Um, the sticking point is the unpredictability of a book. Because although the narrative is unpredictable, what I'm doing as a reader is not that unpredictable. And the stories are linear. They're kind of crafted, and they're about cause and effect. They're about climax and payoff. So how do you make a story where, if you remember what we said about pool, unpredictable things can happen but they're constrained, and the story still gets told. Back in the day, there were those branching books where you turn to paragraphs, and they didn't always, but quite a lot of them would sort of do that. And a story got told, but there were 25 others, and no one really cared which one. And it, that lack of, of, of binding of the unpredictability makes the experience disposable. So we need to be careful of that. Um, so the challenge for designers who trying to do this, trying to make stories interactive, uh, is... Um, is somehow getting the author to let go of that total control, that, that fascistic control that authors are, expect and are used to and encouraged to believe in, um, and instead allowing the rules to hold the story together in some sense. Um, but if we can do it, I don't see why we can't make a system that generates a great story 
where the reader is there at every moment of the story's creation. The reader is trapped inside the narrative. They're trapped in the creation process of that narrative. They're with the author, but they're safe. And that sounds like a game, but it also sounds like a story. So, uh, yeah, we, we've had a shot. So this is, the, this is the first time, I think, that a screenshot from the Frankenstein app that we're making this profile has been shown to anyone. So it's another Kobo-style first. Um, as Evan said, there's a difference between books and reading, and Frankenstein is all about reading. So what we have in the picture is there's an illustration on the left, and there's this flow of text on the right in these sort of little chunks, and you can see they're pinned together with a little pin there. And at the bottom, there's the player's input. The player is uh, not exactly a character, but a participant in the narrative. They talk to the protagonist. They talk to the narrator. They ask questions. They offer suggestions. They condemn or condone. And then the story flows on. And it isn't a branching narrative, really, because when you choose one of these options, the other one disappears and it's gone. There's no sense that there was something that you left behind or something that you didn't do. There's just a cumulative sense of involvement. The idea is that you're telling a story, but you're always at the, the bleeding edge of it. If you stop doing anything, if you don't press your button, then the story won't get told. You can't skip ahead. You actually can't go back either, um, which will be interesting to see whether people complain about that. But you're always taking those little decisions, and they don't need to be big decisions. They don't need to be choices. They don't need to be kill the guy or save the guy. They don't, we don't need to play on that level in the way that video games do. We can do things in a slow and subtle way um, and just make the reader part of a dialogue with the author and still ensure that the story gets told. It's Frankenstein. We all know how it starts. Less of us know how it ends because no one's actually got through it. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think this is a great project, because this is much easier to read. Um, Laura, in her talk about ebook singles, mentioned curling up on the sofa and had this nice graphic of a guy sort of curled up with his iPad. And I think that's one of the things that, that this kind of gentle gamification, this gentle interactivity can do, is it can keep you putting a little bit of something back in. When I read an ebook, I find for myself, that there's an energy sap effect. Every time I do something, every time I turn a page, I've got a little bit less energy for it than I had before because I just keep putting stuff in and it, it, doesn't, really, it doesn't really give me things. It, I, I find it very, very alienating. Whereas here, the idea is you do a little something, you get a little reward. You make a little comment, you get a little reply. So there's an energy boost just on every little choice. You may think I'm talking rubbish. Um, you'll have to find out in April 26th um, and you can find out for yourself and I'd love to know what you think. Uh, but I quite like it, and I have now read Frankenstein, which I've got to admit I hadn't before. Um, so there we go. And along the way, we can construct other things. We can make the player complicit in things. We can make the player take ownership of things. Um, I don't think this will replace normal books. I'm not suggesting that it will. Um, I don't think we want it to. Uh, we like books. But we think that kind of interaction design, game design, these ideas of what's the player supposed to feel? What are they going to do to make them feel that way? In the case of Frankenstein, I want them to feel like they're there. So we make them do something that makes them feel like they're there. That's it. Simple as that. Um, I think we can create something compelling. And I think that probably should be what we're trying to do with electronic devices. We should be trying to make compelling experiences. And e-books are one way of doing that. But it's not the only way of doing that. Uh, and that's something I think we need to think about. And when we're gamifying in general, that's the question. It's not how do I discover books, or how do I sell books, or how do I make people review books? It's how do I make the experience compelling? If that sells ebooks on the side, then great, but your bottom line is you're entertainers. You need to entertain people. And computers give us a kind of unusual way of doing that. So if you're still skeptical and you don't like the sound of it, my last thought, which I apologize, this is glib, um, is it's too late, books are games anyway. They have rules. The rules are you read every sentence and you turn the page. You can cheat. You don't have to read every sentence, but you still have to turn the page. Uh, they have progression, as we said. They have unpredictability in that you don't quite know what's going to happen next. Um, they are virtual spaces into which players enter, stumble onto the stage with a script, nervous, not sure what's going to happen, not sure if they want to commit to this book because it might be too sad or it might be too scary, but they try. And the author says, don't worry, it's going to be okay. The author is the rules. They're just very simple games. They're just very simple interactions. So what we're trying to do at Inkle is make them just ever so slightly more complicated and see where that takes us. Uh, and there's been a few other people doing this, I think. Um, you know, I'm sure all you guys have seen the Nosy Crow apps, which are an excellent example 
of this kind of interaction. They take kids' books and they put little bits of interaction in them. And once you've read a couple of them, you start to think, oh, yeah, this is what picture books were always doing. They just couldn't do it before. And I, I really think that's true. Um, because books aren't passive. People say, oh, well, you know, it's, there's passive literature and there's interactive literature. We don't want interactive. Books aren't passive. They never were passive. When we read a book, we're, we're doing a hell of a lot of work. We're converting this text into action. We've got actors in our heads. They're doing things. We're interpreting. We're improvising when we read. Um, books are exhausting, or good books are anyway. Like, you read a chapter and you go, oh, I've managed the chapter. I've completed that chapter. I'm going to put the book down and I'm going to have a break which is exactly what I do when I finish a difficult level and uncharted. It's the same. So, games create scenarios. That's why gamification is powerful, because it makes scenarios, and it makes them come alive. So if you want to enrapture people, you can provide them a scenario if you can gamify it. I'm not suggesting that's the solution to everything, and I don't mean to sound like a preacher, but I do think it's powerful, and I do think it's misunderstood. So perhaps I've given you a little sense of, of why I might think that. Um, the last thing I've written in my notes, and my jet lag is really catching up with me now, and I don't know why I wrote this. I've written, Twitter is social, so we tend to believe that it's normal, but it's not. So I leave you with that slightly cryptic thought. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for listening. Um, there's about five minutes left if there's any questions. Um, how many people did you have, how many resources did you need for Brandon's, the creation of that? Okay. Um, and how, what was your timeline? Uh, you okay. Um, well, Inkle is me and a one man, so there's two of us. Uh, he does all the coding. I do the kind of tool side and the design side and the talking. Hello. Um, we have a writer who's written the entire content. It's about 155,000 words, I think. Uh, we have a publisher and some marketing people, and they're kind of overseeing the outward facing in talking to journalists and that sort of thing. But they haven't done very much in the way of content creation. They've given a little bit of artwork, but mostly we've done the art ourselves. Uh, we started building it in December of last year. We've worked on a few other projects along the side, so it's hard to give an exact number of man hours. Um, and it's basically done. Uh, it's also a platform, so this one took a little bit longer. The next one, we should be able to... Well, you always have to write the content. You've got to write the book. Fundamentally, you can't skip that. We're not auto-generating or anything like that. That would be a, a really bad idea, I think. Um, but yeah, the next one we hope to be able to put out in about two, three weeks. Hi there. Um, Hi. One of my questions revolves around royalty payments to the author. I mean, it's a Frankenstein story, so I suppose that's a public domain. Yeah. And then you've got an author to write a, a version of that? Is that how that Yeah, works? it's pretty much an adaptation. Yeah. And do you then offer royalties? I'm not sure if the British system is very different from the Canadian system. I work at a media interactive company. That's why I'm asking from a different perspective mm -hmm. than a publisher where we're coming a across a lot of royalty conversations and we're from a different space where we just pay you for your work and mm. say thank you, mm. but we're coming against royalty conversations, so I'm wondering how you handled that. Well, um, actually, this was, this was dictated to us by our publisher, but the model they suggested is exactly the one we wanted. There's a lot of talk about partnership in the kind of digital culture in London at the moment and, and the UK, and I, I don't know if there is here or not, but... Um, that's definitely one of the core ideas. So it's all royalty-based. There are advances flying around to make sure people stay solvent and that. But fundamentally, there's a royalty to the publisher, there's a royalty to the author, there's a royalty to us. It's split. Um, and I think that's the way you have to go with this sort of stuff, if only because it's quite risky and there isn't really a powerful player. Like, I think in a model where a publisher doesn't pay a royalty to an app developer or a writer or something, that's probably because the publisher is powerful enough to get away with that. Um, but actually... In this instance, we don't know if this will sell 500 copies or if it will sell a million. I really hope it sells a million. I would be surprised if it did, but it would be nice. Um, so by using a royalty system, everybody is stakeholder in that. And I think there's a lot of sense in that. And I think there's kind of a lot of goodwill in that as well. But that's the way we've gone. All right, okay, thank you very much.